Hello everyone, my name is Ray Konopka with Ray Software and welcome to this session in the Desktop First UX Summit 2021 edition. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about how tab controls can ruin our desktop UX. Um, before we get into that, just a little background about myself. My name is Ray Kanopka. I'm president and founder of Ray Software. I'm also a principal software engineer for the Walt Disney Attractions Technology Company. Uh, I've created a number of products over the years, written some books, lots of articles, uh, presented at many conferences and sessions. Uh, I like to specialize in UI UX design, component development, and application architecture. Uh, I'm an Embarcadero Delphi MVP, and I am a diehard Chicago Cub fan. Uh, although it has been quite the challenging year this summer. Um, so, why are tab controls so popular? Well, there's three main reasons. First, they're extremely visually expressive. Uh, they convey what they do and what their purpose and intent is very concretely. So almost instantaneously, a user can see it and have an understanding of how it should work. They're also extremely spatially efficient, meaning that for really a kind of a small amount of screen real estate, we can group content together in a, in a, in a more logical way. We can isolate it more appropriately to convey information, to kind of guide our users to understand what we're trying to present to them and how to organize it. Um, and so we, we have a really big bang for our buck with respect to the pixels we use up on the screen. But probably the most important reason why tabs are so popular is they are extremely easy to use. Uh, as I said before, because of the visual expressive nature of it, the way they look, their affordance is obvious, meaning how you interact with that control is really simple and straightforward uh, because it takes some concept from the real world and blends it into the digital world. So when we see tabs, we understand that each of those tabs represents a different piece of content. And whether that's settings in a dialog box or different views of a particular document or multiple documents, all that comes through. So really what tab controls do is they help us manage content. And if we look historically of how tabs kind of came to their uh, you know, ubiquitous presence in our applications, we get a better understanding of what this really means. So tab controls manage our content uh, by providing quick access to alternative views. This is probably the original use case for you know, tabs. The most obvious example uh, still prevalent today are spreadsheets. And so when you have different sheets in your your spreadsheet document, uh, you can use the tabs to switch between them. Uh, a number of IDEs will, will also implement this uh, approach and we'll take a look at lots of examples throughout this session. Um, the, the next real strength of tab controls uh, in managing content is by isolating related content. Uh, the classic example of this are options dialog boxes. And they've been around for many, many years now. Um, and as we'll see, sometimes it works really well. Um, other times, forcing that tab metaphor can actually be problematic. And that's really what this session is all about, is talking about okay, tabs work well in this case, but if we go too far or we try to bend the rules a little bit, we can actually make life more challenging for our users. So we'll have a lot to talk about options dialogues in a, in a bit, but the, the fundamental purpose of a tab control in that context is to isolate related content so our users don't have to look at everything at one time, we can kind of manage them into digestible pieces that what we're presenting makes sense to them. Uh, and then the final uh, kind of area where tab controls really help manage content is by organizing documents. And this is the, the tab document model that is pretty much prevalent everywhere now. Um, you know, it's, it replaces the old uh, multiple document interface, which, which had its uses, but also was cumbersome to use at the same time. And so by 
utilizing tabs to organize our documents, it added a little bit of flexibility, so much so that it's really become prevalent. Now, that's not to say there aren't design challenges with them, but you know, when we look at the, all the web browsers pretty much support the tab document model, lots of integrated development environments do, uh, certainly graphic design tools as well. And because of that nature, there's been some enhancements to the way tab controls work and how users interact with them to support that and then where it gets really challenging is when we start using one style of tab functionality for another unintended purpose and we can get some disconnects with our users so really we've all seen we've all used we've all interacted with tab controls and it, they work quite well However, there are challenges when it comes to UX design. Uh, one of the first and foremost is how do we handle a large number of tabs? This is prevalent across the use case, whether it's, you know, separating views in our context, whether we have, you know, our options dialogues, we need to, you know, we have so many options in our applications. How do we manage that with tab controls? Is that really even the best choice is the question we ultimately want to ask. And then when it comes to managing, you know, documents in our tab document model, well, what if we have a lot of documents open, which is quite common. Uh, and so there's a variety of ways that we can handle that. Uh, the management of context is also critically important when it comes to uh, using tab controls. This is really prevalent in options dialog boxes and how we're conveying what is going on, what is the user interacting with given a selected page of the tab control. So we'll have a lot to talk about some of those. Uh, styling issues is another thing that has really started to become problematic where designers, graphics designers, have gotten away from the obvious affordance of a tab control to make things a little bit more streamlined and a little bit more subtle. And we, we lose some of the affordance where it can actually cause disconnects to an uncertainty in the users interacting with the controls. And we'll have lots of examples for all of that. Uh, and then uh, the, the, the last, I guess, general category of challenges is really talking about mixing of metaphors. Uh, again, one of the, the strengths of the tab control is its affordance and its understanding that users clearly get how you interact with the control. However, given changes in style designing and things that have happened over the years, we, we've some situations have blended multiple metaphors into the tab structure and it causes a disconnect. So we're going to go through lots of examples covering all of this. So let's talk about tab quantity. Like how many tabs? Well, tabs by themselves, regardless of intent, are work really well when your quantity is less than 10 generally probably around seven. You know, if you think about how wide of a screen you have, the context you want, uh, obviously the number of tabs and what is visible and interacting uh, is dependent on the tab titles. So obviously shorter tab titles make more sense. Longer tab titles either get clipped or they take up a lot of extra real estate. So you're limited on the number of tabs that are visually available to be interacted with. Um, one of the key cornerstones that I think we've slowly started to get to is the tab should occupy only one row and not the multi-line style that is still supported. Um, they are very cumbersome to use and they're confusing because the way to implement them requires reordering and shifting around. Uh, however, there are still applications that do use that capability. So let's talk, let's look at some examples. And so let me switch over. I don't know if I have that up and running. There we go. I'll go to my Scratchpad application here. And a Scratchpad is a little editor um, written by uh, Ray Software, yours truly. And uh, one of the things that I wanted to look at before we talk about the view itself is the, the, the options dialogue. And this is one of the, the, the 
kind of the bread and butter use cases for tab controls is to organize content into easily digestible chunks for the user to understand and manage. And so here we have an example where we've got one row of tabs. Um, there's not an enormous number of options. It still works within a pretty reasonable set of, you know, there's printing categories, there's key assignments, syntax highlighting, autocorrect templates, all of these general features are all within, you know, one little dialogue, easily digestible. Um, when we look at this, you could kind of might be thinking, well, should I put the gutter and margin and the miscellaneous and the word wrapping and tab settings on its own tab? You could, but then we're going to add in three more tabs, which means we're going to have to make this dialogue much wider. And we don't get much benefit for doing that because the amount of content that we're going to have with just one of these groups is really limited. When showing things that are related, which is all kind of text editing related features, yes, let's group those together. So I'm going to go ahead and cancel that. and. The next one I want to bring up is uh, an application called Source Insight. And uh, this is uh, an application that analyzes your source code and, and does some interesting things with it. Um, what I'm more interested in is strictly their, their options dialogue because it is actually showing a use case of a multi-line options dialogue. And as you've seen this, maybe you haven't seen it in a while, but as you type through, the first set of tabs is reasonably okay. I'll have comments about the styling that this is the Windows style, and I'll comment on this when we get to the styling section. But the piece I wanted to talk about is what happens when you click on this back row, I guess top row, it's not real clear again because of the styling. But if I click on this, everything shifts now. And so once you understand that, it's kind of effective in switching it around, but many users find that extremely cumbersome to navigate. And it'd be better, there's other alternate ways in order to manage that uh, instead of using one row. Now, in this context, in a, a dialogue for options, does it make sense to put this as a single row that you would scroll to the other things? No, obviously not. The, the benefit of the multi-line is to show all of the available tabs. The problem we lose is that the, the affordance of the tabs get lost because they move around, and that's not how real tabs work. The, the order should be implied. So what you'll find most option dialogues doing these days is to using another navigational page or you know vertical tabs, which you could also do. But unfortunately, the Windows tab control doesn't support vertical tabs or tabs on the left and right to where you could do a combination of both because all of these captions aren't actually bad. You could make it a little bit wider, still use the affordance of the tabs, but you wouldn't have to have multiple lines. So we have lots of options to improve it without relying on, you know, coming up with a completely different metaphor. So next up, we're still under the context of handling multiple tabs, large numbers of tabs, but I really want to focus on the document, the tab document model, and how is this managed by various applications? Because the, the unlike options, which are fixed in size, the application defines the set of options that are there. Now, there's either enough to manage in a set of tab controls and tabs, or there's too much, and we need to come up with a different method to do that. However, with the tab document model, you're essentially unlimited in the number of tabs. It's how many documents you want to open. And, and I'm sure you know, there are many of you out there that have you know, your web browser up and you're trying to you know, research an issue or look up something and you've got you know, 15 tabs open in your web browser. And, and how do we manage that number of tabs to make it visually effective? Um, there are, turns out, a variety of methods available but unfortunately, there's, there's no clear consensus on how best to handle it. 
Um, maybe we'll get to some of that, but it kind of each company is kind of on its own and how it develops that. So let's take a look at a variety of, of, of applications that handle or how they handle multiple tabs. So first up, let's take a look at Chrome. So I have the Chrome web browser opened here and I have a number of tabs opened up. And the interesting thing that we want to focus on is uh, how do we manage, how do we navigate through switching between the various tabs uh, and what we want. And one of the things that's very interesting in, in the, the most recent releases of all these browsers and what they've gotten into is in, they, they've avoided the scrolling functionality. So if I have more tabs than my windows width, rather than have them be off view, the tabs remain visible. Now, if you get to a point where there are so many tabs that you can't even have the minimum size that they will offload into some other mechanism. But right now, you know, using the icons can somehow times help. You know, I've, I've got a few from the Ray software site that are open. I have a number from Embarcadero's uh, website and I can move my mouse over and, and pull up a hint on each one. But navigating to the one I'm interested in can be quite a challenge if I'm trying to click through them. And so one of the ways in which uh, Chrome manages multiple tabs is by having a, a, a button here to drop down and search for the tabs. And, and what I find fascinating about this is that we've switched to a vertical layout, which is great, so I can easily see it. But because each item in the layout is so big and there's so much spacing around it with extra information about when I accessed it and so forth, I don't even have all of the tabs visible. I have to scroll to get to the rest of the tabs. The other thing that's quite odd about this is that there's no apparent order to this list. Uh, at first, you might think it might be most recently used, and so it would move to the top. Well, no, not necessarily. The, the one you're on moves to the bottom. I believe that's because it thinks that that's the one you would not be interested in. And so um, switching it around, uh, the, the now, now this is my Bitbucket account is back up to the top. So it's very odd. It's very hard to find what's here because they're not even listed in the order in which they appear in the tab. So there's some heuristics that are involved. I actually find it quite frustrating trying to locate something quickly, but this is one method that's, that's handling it. Um, if we look at um, the Edge browser, uh, which I have the exact same set of tabs set up inside of here. Uh, one of the things that's interesting is that they don't have a, a drop down uh, menu or pop up to help me navigate through the, the, the tabs that I have on the screen. Instead, uh, the latest version of, of Edge has introduced vertical tabs, uh, where if you turn on vertical tabs, it gives you the tabs on the left side which is actually quite interesting. What I find, they're calling it vertical tabs, but they actually don't make them look like tabs. And so that, that's kind of frustrating to me to where it's like, okay, yes, I do know that when I've clicked on one of these pieces, because this is highlighted differently, that's the page I'm on, but it doesn't look like a tab. And so we're having to make connections between, oh yes, historically we've called each web page a tab, and now I'm gonna have a new tab for that. So I have a little problem with that, but at least I can see all of the tabs that are in the list, and it's maintained in the original order in which is there. So it's somewhat better to find it, certainly not any faster. And then of course, if I've got a lot more tabs then I'm off the screen and I have to scroll, that also is, is an issue. And then, um, so let me, I can change that back to turn off the vertical ones. Uh, next up, I wanted to take a look at uh, Safari. And so here's the Safari browser. Uh, again, the same set of tabs. One thing's interesting that, and this is on the Mac side, um, that 
you know, Apple decided not to even show partial text once the tab gets to a minimum size and only use the icon to do it. So, which is okay, you know, it, but it does eliminate some information. So I don't know what any of these are. And, you know, finally, if I hover enough, it will take me to a preview of it. But uh, again, kind of a bit of a challenge. One of the things that's interesting is I've, I can't tell you how many times I've clicked on this and this just shows me downloads, not actually the tabs. You have to click on this button. And what it does is it actually presents a view, a preview of each of the web pages that you're looking at, which sounds great, except it's it's still clipping the text of the page that I'm interested in, so not necessarily great that way. And because they're big previews, I still have to scroll to get to the rest of my content. So eh, it's OK. Again, lots of ways to handle multiple tabs. Each one's kind of different and has its pros and cons. And so uh, I can go back and we'll click that one. Gets me back to my, my view. Uh, let me go back over to. Um, my Windows side and I'll bring up the scratch pad uh, application I mentioned before and I'll clear this up so we can see and this has the same thing it's a tab document model uh, for you know files to edit and the approach that it takes is it has a drop down menu but the menu is alphabetized with all of the tabs that are there and because it's only one line per tab you can actually get quite a large number of tabs that are visible and it doesn't shrink the the view down now they're off view and the scroll buttons are there but the nice thing with this is that if i want to go to the standings i can just click and find what file i'm looking for and it will jump around and navigate so again another ways different ways in which to present multiple tabs to your users but be sure to pick something and be consistent across it if you are in that situation. All right, the next topic I want to talk about is managing context. Um, tabs are extremely effective when the content is moderately sized. Uh, if you have a lot of context, that's when things can be quite cumbersome. Uh, and this is where we run into the case of nested tabs. And nested tabs on its surface sound really nice. You know, it's like, oh, I've got a, one group and I've got another group of data that's inside of that group. And, and I can use that to manage and present different pieces of information. The, the problem that we get into is that we've we've lost the affordance of what the tab control does because we are taking because tabs don't work like that if we have a folder we don't stick the in our file cabinet you know list of tabs you're not necessarily putting other tabs inside of that and trying to manage that so we get into some conflict of how is the data managed but the, Along with that, along with just the nested tabs and the organizational issues you have to watch out for, we also have to make sure that we keep the context to the user appropriately. So let's take a look at what I mean by that. So the first example we're going to take a look at is a program called Isobuster. Uh, and it's uh, an older version, but it really captures one of the challenges that I've seen uh, in a lot of dialog boxes. And so let's pull up uh, version 2x of uh, Isobuster. And uh, we'll, we'll pull up just the file system settings, for example. And at first, when I first saw this, I thought this was a multi-row tab control. It kind of looked like it, but I couldn't understand uh, again, it might be hard to pick up in the, the replay, but there's three active tabs. And then it became clear once I looked a little bit further that we actually have three nested tabs in the mix. And the, the outer tabs that are on the list here represent the menu item that they've picked. And so if we go to the communication, it goes right to the communication tab and goes back to the file systems. Of course, each of these other pieces have other data with subcategories. And, and I totally get why that 
you know, developers would go into this route because it's a way of categorizing data. However, um, it's, uh, well, actually, this is my favorite one where they, they don't have any special settings yet, so let's have an empty tab. Um, but what really what has come about we don't see this as much anymore. We still do. There's still cases where it comes in. But again, this much data, there's too much of it. And so applications like, you know, the Office applications and this even ISOBuster 4.0 uh, has gone with a tree structure to navigate through the various categories because visually it's clearer. There is a hierarchical nature of these settings so let's present that and it's actually much easier to navigate through that now that's another talk that's another section of having a tree structure drive your ui you have to make sure there's an association between the node in the tree that's selected and the page you're editing too often developers make the tree and it looks just like another option in this big options dialogue and so special care needs to be handled for that but again that's a different you know talk um, so we want to avoid that um, another example where um, this comes into play is if we look at uh, the, the t-chart component that's part of uh, rad studio and if we double click on it we bring up the editor and it looks like it's organized as a tree structure um, and it is to obviously to some extent but as we see as we drill down into it there's more and more tabs that are inside of the various pieces so much so that you can drill down quite a bit in there and i think it's arguable to where is the tree on the left giving us enough value if we're having this type of structure that's between it why am i switching between each of those now i you could argue that by switching the different axes it kind of keeps the context there uh if you were to change the bevel and you could go for each of those but you could still do that with it expanded as well so this is one of those things to where um an alternate approach would be rather than use the exact same tab style that's in each one of these is to actually do groups of them like for example the frame the corners the call out the bevel none of those pages are very big why not have the border settings all on four different groups on this page that represent the frame the corners call out and bevel because I'd rather see all of those at once than this constant switching between the various tabs because that's how they were grouped. So uh, again, grouping kind of works well, but we want to take time to manage the content that without going down to the lowest possible level, let's eliminate some of that and see if we can structure this a little bit easier to, to manage. All right, so then the next up, we're going to talk about styling and tabs are extremely effective when they look like tabs, uh, when it's easy to distinguish the active tab from inactive tabs, uh, when that active tab is clearly associated with the content that is is intended to group together. Um, it's when they don't it's when the tabs have different styling or non-obvious styling or coloring that breaks the metaphor and thus causes users to stop and wonder okay is that a tab is that not a tab is that associated with this pain or that pain um it's also you know we looked a little bit of it we should be considering tab orientation where it makes sense so let's take a look at some examples. So to start, we'll take a look at uh, the Microsoft Word and their font options. So let me switch over to Word, bring that up, and we'll bring up the font options dialog. And one of the things that's interesting, and this is again, because the Microsoft styling of the controls and making the tabs very boxy, having a very light window background and having the content area of tabs be white, um, it's very easy for users to miss that there is an actual advanced tab on the fonts sitting in the back there. And so, yes, it's kind of 
we've gotten to this let's go real subtle with the tabs and, and have a look at what that looks like uh, so that's something to watch out for um, and then we've gotten rid of the overlap concept in a lot of tabs these days so the order is not necessarily implied and we're using some other visual cue to determine which one is active and so let's go to my other example is let's take a look at Excel and if we look at how Excel handles sheets, we can see that uh, it's actually quite obvious which one, which sheet is active. They're, they're using an, a highlighted bar. They're changing the color of the text, but uh, they're bolding it as well. Uh, but it's quite different than the background. It's not as subtle as you know Word does it for its options dialog. Why? I don't know. It's the same company, but that's what they've done uh, but let's take another example let's take a look at this is separating views with tabs and typically that will be at the bottom of the page so same document but different views in that document different context sections let's take a look at rad studio and uh, how it manages the same piece there's actually lots of tabs that are used inside of rad studio here um, Unfortunately, aside from the editing tab, there's a, a which you know, shows you which one's active and which one's not. Um, I can go ahead and bring up another form, and we can see that we can switch between it. It's quite obvious which one's active. Again, however, we're really not necessarily associating it with all of this because we just have a bar that's above it. So there's a, an implied context to that. Um, but if we look down at the bottom, this is actually a tab. Doesn't look like a tab. It just looks like a white box around code. Happens I can click on it. When I click on design, it's a little bit better because the white of the tab matches the white of this background. So it now does look like a tab sheet. But when you go to the code or the history, you lose that context. Um, because we also have no structure to the tabs and we're just highlighting it with a white background, I, I can't tell you how many times I have thought that these tabs here were connected to what's below it. So I've got like an area here, but no, they're actually tied to what's above. And it's only because I have three tabs here that I know that, oh, the white one is the active one, even though Data Explorer and multiple device previews actually look like they're connected to this page up top. So uh, again, because of we're trying to make things a little bit smoother and get rid of lines and so forth, we've eliminated some of the affordances that tab controls give us. So next up, I'm gonna take a look at Microsoft News. Let me go ahead and minimize this down, uh, minimize Excel and Word. We'll get back all to those. So Microsoft News is kind of interesting because this is their, you know, you know, kind of a web-based desktop app that they've created. It gives you all this news access. You know, it's great. And then you have this bar at the top that you know kind of looks like a tab control although styled not really the same because we just have a bar that's underneath it but if i were to pick on you know politics huh okay well that all shifted across and i click on science and oh well there's the top stories so based on what i've clicked i'm actually shifting it over and so not only do I not have the affordance of a tab control, which is what it's doing, I'm actually changing it up to switch it around so the user doesn't know what they're actually, where to find it. And so uh, that's a little odd uh, to me personally of how they're making that work. It does kind of look fancy and slick at the expense of the user losing their place between the two. Uh, and going back to what they were interested in. Um, I, why not just click on politics and have the underline be there? And if I wanted to go back to top stories or the other values, I can easily do that. So uh, that's another, again, styling deficiency in the tabs. So next up, let's take a look at OneNote because OneNote is like, 
it used tabs like crazy uh, back in the day. Uh, and it still works if we go to um, uh, just OneNote. Then I had this from the Office applications, and there's a OneNote for Windows 10, which I'll, I'll show you in a bit. But this is how they used to define OneNote. And it's when they moved it to the mobile platform that they ended up having to change it a bit because it was harder to navigate. So I get that. But there's a, some interesting things about this is we have this kind of Outlook, old Outlook bar, collapsible nodes. But if we look at the tabs, there are colored tabs, which is how you would set up you know, inside of a notebook, you'd have tabs for your various sections. And then inside of there, you could have various pages that you would have. And, and this is quite effective. It does look like tabs vertical. So I get a lot of data here, full titles. And if I shorten it up, it clips them as appropriately. But it's quite nice. Um, one of the things that's, that's kind of odd, though, is because I have more space, more tabs in more sections in this notebook, the, the drop down is quite odd because it's showing me like exhibiting speaker future vendor. Vendor sessions is there, but tutorials is not. And regular sessions active is there. So it kind of skipped two of them and it decided to pick vendor sessions. So it's looking to see what would fit in there, I think. Uh, it's just a little weird way in which it uh, manages that. But the vertical tabs on the sides, actually pretty darn effective inside of this one section. If we take a look at OneNote for Windows 10 and take a look at what it does, this was redesigned to get rid of those uh, top section tabs where they actually made them vertical as well and inside of that you still have the, the vertical tabs that you can scroll with they made it a little bit bigger but they got rid of the affordance that um, ties it to that page which I wish they would have kept because they could have like this could have actually had a white bar that highlighted it and showed me in addition to the title with that that I'm actually using that page and blend that in here we have the affordance of like oh the vertical tab indicator for the section color kind of helps so again styling goes a long way to convey how we use a particular control So next up, I want to take a few minutes and talk about mixing metaphors and what happens with um, when we try to combine do different things and have the, the, the tab control do both. And that's where we run into problems. And so um, I have two examples to, to show about that. So my two examples involve the ribbon. And the ribbon's a very effective tool, and, but it's a modified version of the, the tab styling. And so let's take a look at two examples here. We'll start with WordPad. And um, WordPad's interesting because it's using the ribbon, but because of the styling that they used, it's, it's easy to understand why users would think file is the active tab and not home because the home and view color is so close to one another. Uh, but it actually is home is the active tab and view is the tab. And when I hit file, I actually don't switch tabs. I get a pop up. And so I've, I've disconnected. I've, I've used a, a pop up structure metaphor with the tab control and you cause disconnects. Um, interestingly, if I go and take a look at Microsoft Word, Word does the same thing, but they've kind of gotten rid of the, the tab look of the ribbon sections. So I'm not calling them tabs now, but there are sections for that. But they're tabs. We all know they're tabs. That's what they were originally. But again, to smooth out the styling, they've just kind of made these things subtle. And you can just tell which one's active by the underline, um, which, you know, again, OK, makes sense. I can switch between my tabs. But if I go and click File, I get completely new window overtakes the entire UI and and I don't care who you are even once you 
realize that's what happens, it's a disconnect from that. Uh, I think there's a better way that which they could have done that same thing if that's what they want to accomplish. Um, it should not have been that uh, because that just is so disconcerting to what's there. And it's not obvious on where to find anything over in there because this file now does so much stuff and not just files anymore, uh, which is part of the problem. Um, so that's one of the things we have to watch out when we do this mixed metaphor. So some other considerations when we're talking about tab controls is um, tab navigation. Uh, this was really common on a variety of websites, uh, basically to use tabs on web pages to facilitate the various sections on the website to go to. And I've seen that translated to desktop applications as well. Fortunately, both of those are kind of losing favor because, again, they're harder to manage. Um, it, it's not obvious that uh, why to do that. There's other ways to section off uh, navigation pieces. However, where tab controls the controls themselves are really effective is in implementing wizards uh, because you can have you know confined content you want to go to the next step and the next step but you have to remember to hide the tabs when you do that i've seen wizard examples where step one you know says capture the address step two says you know pick your shipping methods step three says calculate total price and then it you know submits the order but a tab allows you to navigate independently. It doesn't imply any order. And so that's something to be concerned with. Um, another consideration with using tabs is if you're presenting content that makes sense to compare, then using tabs to group that can be quite the challenge because it forces the user to switch back and forth between the tabs and you can't see them both at the same time. So keep that in mind when deciding whether a tabbed interface is most appropriate. So some design guidelines that uh, you can consider uh, for using tabs is, you know, arrange tabs in the order that's a appropriate for the users. Keep that in mind. Don't put the least used pieces in the first tab. Have it most important to least important. Uh, try to use one or two words at most for your titles. Easily digestible nuggets of groupings. That's what makes them really effective. If you have four or five, you know, half a sentence describing the tab, that then you're missing the the the, the subtlety or the, the the quick access the tabs give you. Uh, don't use all caps for your tabs. You use title capitalization. Again, we're only using a couple words anyway. Uh, as before, don't use multiple line tabs. Avoid using nested tabs. Um, just to make it easier for our users to navigate between those. Um, be sure to ensure that the active tab stands out from inactive tabs. Uh, there's a real benefit to, to doing that. And, um, and also be, you know, be sure to check out different orientations, have some fun with them, try some different layouts that, that you can incorporate to make them more effective. So real quick, I'm going to wrap this session up with a quick demo of the RZ page control and tab control that are part of the Kanopka signature controls that are available in Rad Studio. Um, so let's take a quick look at what those uh, components give us. OK, so here I have uh, Rad Studio uh, 10.4 open, and I'm going to drop a, a TRZ page control down. The tab control is exactly the same, except it doesn't have separate content pieces inside of it. Um, but once we go ahead and drop this down and we click New Page, we can immediately see that uh, the style that's used presents a difference between the four the, the, the active tab and the, the, the inactive tabs using the different styles that's there. Um, there's actually a number of built-in styles. You can go with backslash. That was quite common for a while. Double slant if you want to go kind of that old uh, older looking uh, feature there. Cut corners, quite modern. And you can control various pieces of, of each of these. Uh, one of the things that's quite nice, uh, and whether you have round corners or square, um, is all built into the component. Um, what's quite neat is if we go back, say, to the cut corner and change the orientation, we can put those tabs on the bottom, obviously. 
we can go and put them on the left for example and the, the left uh, puts them it rotates the text uh, if we want to do that we can go in and uh, change a variety of of features uh, for that using the various properties that are in the component and so if we go down to you know text orientation it's vertical we can make that horizontal we can set the uh, the sequence to be the the top we can put that over on the the orientation and we'll uh, put that over on the right side switch those up make that horizontal so if you wanted to implement vertical tabs in your control uh, it's quite easy to do that and so uh, if we would change that to the tab corners and you can make those uh, pieces in there uh, if you want to take a look at more of the features that are inside of the component um, you can run the demo program that comes with it it actually is a quick way to show uh, the various settings that are there like it has built-in support for the close button on each tab that's active has support for the drop down menu just implicitly built in you don't have to do anything other than set the show drop menu component uh, property to be true and you can navigate with that tabs can be disabled uh, individually you can also uh, color your tabs so if you wanted to do coloring uh, that's built into the component uh, along with various uh, you can support images on each of the tabs so a whole variety of different ways in order to um, to get the effect the tab control appearance and usability that you're looking for in your applications and of course it does pick up uh, VCL styles so it'll pick up the coloring that's active for the current style and and make that uh, use that same style for each of the tabs uh, that's there So that's all the information I have uh, today. Uh, I hope you found this very informative uh, and useful information, some extra guidelines, things to watch out for when we're working with tabs, because we do it all of the time. It's quite common. They're very easy to use. Uh, but we want to watch out that we, we make life for our users easy and we don't make it more complicated because we decided to be a little fancy or we decided to not spend the extra effort to create the hierarchical structure we need for our data and we just start dropping things into multiple tab controls. Um, so keep all those things in mind. Uh, I will be joining for the questions and answers. Uh, and if you have any follow-up questions after this, please feel free to reach out to me and I'm always happy to uh, help where I can. Thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the Desktop First UX Summit. Thank you. All right, so if there's any questions, go ahead and put in the question panel here and we'll get those posted. Oh, there I can turn my camera on too. Although I'm going to be a different angle. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's uh, kind of unfortunate. Go to meetings kind of starting to show uh, show some deficiencies. We 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 rebroadcast re this because of technical difficulties during the Desktop Summit, and uh, we kind of had uh, a little bit of challenges. Uh, people being able to see the demos and so forth, but. I, I hope the, the general theme, the concepts were un visible enough in the, the video, um, but obviously in the replay, we'll make sure that that's in the full 10 or 1920 by 1080 resolution. Yes, yeah, absolutely. That'll be all corrected in the replay. Uh, I Actually, I did, I liked the way, I always enjoy this in your talks, that you do such a good job of taking like, different things I've used before, like Excel and Word or OneNote, et cetera, and then showing the way the, the principles that you talk about, how they apply and how that impacts it. Because that a lot of times it's things like I've noticed before, but then haven't really thought about, for example, or it's a good way of, of seeing the, the principles you're talking about in practice. Uh, well, thank you. I appreciate that. And that, that really is part of the intent of those kinds of comparisons. I mean, when it comes to UI design and whether you're a designer or a developer, I mean, we're all in the same boat of making our applications more usable to our customer base. And one of the tenets of that is consistency. And, and but that's a double-edged sword, you know, because Cons being consistent with a good design naturally promotes ease of use because people will be familiar with it. They'll experience it before and they'll 
implicitly know how it works when they're approached with a new situation. However, consistency with a bad design can propagate further and further along and cause problems. You know, my, my classic example of a bad UI element artifact is the print preview icon. You know, a magnifying glass with a piece of paper is a stretch to be a print preview. And, um, you know, we, there's nothing that indicates printing is an end result there. And, uh, and so, but we, again, we have to use that because everybody's become accustomed to seeing that particular item. And the same is true with uh, the, the, the corollary to consistency is that developers and designers want to be different. They want to come up with a way that makes their application different. If you remember when you know Office 6 was first released and everybody wanted, every business application needed to look like Office and every website needed to look like you know the standard website and picked up a lot of Amazon features and things like that. And mm -hmm. then it's like, well, now we're not any different than any other app. Why, how do we differentiate ourselves? And that's fine, right. but we've now kind of gone too far with our tab controls. And that was the whole point of the session is that we've lost some of the benefits of what made tab controls so effective. Yeah, it, it, it's, it is an interesting thing. Someone pointed out here that there was a uh, uh, long time ago, Nader says there was a book from Microsoft called Design Guide and it asked if it's forgotten by the new generation. So I think it's, it's interesting that oftentimes there are, you know, really good sets of guidelines like that one and other ones that are great that we do forget about and we have to relearn it. I remember us talking to uh, Uncle Bob a while back, uh, Robert C. Martin, and he mentioned how there's so many of these problems that we solved years ago in computer science that we keep re-solving again and again and again, and not necessarily in a better way. Um, I, I don't know why that is that seems to be really common in our industry, but then also the same well, thing you were saying is no. that the design, the best practice evolves as well. Well, exactly, there's there's two facets to that, that whole concept. There's, there's one where, UI and user experience, as we now call it, is ever evolving. You know, as devices become more capable, we are now talking 4K, 5K screens even on the desktop. You know, not to even include the, the handheld devices and the different form factors. You know, there was a time at which you de designed your interface for a 1024 by 768 screen. And that was it. You were done. You know, now you can't do that anymore because you might be running anywhere from that small size all the way up to, you know, a 4,000 by, you know, 3,000 pixel, you know, display, you know, 32 inch display that's got lots of pixel density on it. And then we'll even talk, you know, high definition stuff. That's another topic, you know, altogether. But the point being is that we, we now have to, even our desktop applications, we have to be conscious of things from the mobile space, like, you know, progressiveness, you know, being able to be responsive to screen and device changes, even on a desktop. And, and that's where organizational features of your app, like tab controls, become very important because how we manage that data and present that to the user is really what, what's all there. Now, to the other counter to that, the reason why I think as an industry, we tend to generate the wheel over and over and over again, is that there is, and the same argument has plagued third-party vendors, component vendors for decades now. And that is, oh, I bet I can build it better. And great, you know, that that's that's where it starts, is somebody says like, oh, I bet I could do that better. And they make a better mousetrap. That's really kind of a big incentive for the software development environment. But there is a point at which we kind of sometimes need to step back and say, yeah, I probably could, but maybe I don't have the time to do that. Or maybe somebody else has accomplished it a slightly different way. And you never stop learning in this, you know, yeah. in this career. You have to constantly keep up on top of 
you know, whatever area you're interested in, stay on top of it to learn, see what people are thinking about. Now, that's not to say that it's, you know, looking at the big companies, they're always making great decisions. You can look at Microsoft, Apple, and Google, and all three of them have, in the last five years, have all gone back on UI design changes that they thought were going to be the end-all, be-all. And then once they did that, they got pushback. And then they said, like, oh, wow, this isn't quite as effective as we thought it was. So let's bring a little bit of it back. You know, making everything flat where you see no distinction between anything mm -hmm. that's on the screen, not a good idea. Some of us could have told you that from the get-go. <laughs> but again, you know, who am I? Well, you know, it's a uh, that we because iOS launched with that very skeuomorphic um, UI, and then they went completely away from it to the flat, and everybody went flat for a while, and now they're like, oh, okay, that was too much. So it, it, you do have to always be learning. You have to be looking at what everybody else is doing, whether it works or doesn't work, and then you have to, I mean, you have to just take take a step back and look at what you're doing and use it and see how usable it is and what's fresh, you know, talk to users and stuff. And it's, unfortunately, it's not an easy thing. It is a lot of work. Absolutely. So, well, it's, you know, keeps us all employed. Yes. There's a question here. What, what was the page control that was used at the end in Delphi 10.4? Uh, that is from the Kanopka Signature VCL controls, formerly called Raise Components. Uh, that is freely available. Uh, Embarcadero took ownership of that back in 2015 and has made it available to all uh, Delphi users through uh, the Get It Package Manager. So start up to 10.4, go to Tools, Get It Package Manager, type in Signature, Kanopka, something, and it will pull up the list and you can install it. Now, uh, there will be two versions that are listed in 10.4, uh, 6. Five something and 7.0. Get the 7.0 version because that has the high DPI support that was added in to support the high DPI changes introduced in 10.4. Great. Um, and so we need to wrap up. You have another session here shortly. Um, thanks for your presentation. I was curious what you would think of the tab help index or help text idea along with pre existing complexity. Any advice, advice if it is intuitive information or we should drop it? Tabs help text idea. I'm not sure if I'm following the question. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not either. I'd have to look at that a little bit closer. I'll try to catch uh, that in the couple minutes uh, break between it and see if I can get some more. Uh, but I, if there's anything we don't get to, uh, and I'm doing my next session right after this live, so I won't be able to go back and answer the questions while I'm talking. Uh, so if we don't get to one, or if I can, if we keep them around at the end of the next one, I'll get back and try to answer them. If not, definitely email me. I'm happy to answer any of the, the questions on this. Okay, fantastic. I'm gonna go ahead and shut this down so we can get switched over because you have to do the next session as well. So thank yep. you so much, Ray. Thanks to everybody for joining us this soon. And uh, we'll see you all on the next session. All right, sounds good. Take care, everybody.